Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and about what's next. It's a show that wants to ask questions, peel back the layers of our average everyday experience, and go beyond scratching the surface. We interview amazing people with incredible ideas and stories who have done wild, weird, and wonderful things. Remember that imagination shared create collaboration, and collaboration creates community, and community inspires social change. I'm David Peck, and this is Face to Face. So my conversation today is with Pete Enns. We are talking about his latest book called The Sin of Certainty. It's something you might want to pick up and check out. We, uh, we get into a whole lot of things. We had a lot of fun. I hope, I hope he did too. But we talk uh, a lot about uh, theology. We talk about epistemology and about philosophy. We talk about the sin of certainty and what and what that actually means for Pete and what it's meant for his life. We get a little bit into his background, but essentially we land on this thing called trust and we land on relationships. And we talk about Carl Sagan and we talk about clarity and certainty and Mother Teresa and, and, and what it means to, to actually um, unpack this notion that who we are is wrapped up in other people. How cool is that? Um, Pete Enns coming right up. Don't forget davidpecklive.com for more information about my own speaking, writing, and podcasting and ravel.ca. You can check out more interviews there as well. And, and listen, uh, stay tuned. Uh, this, is, uh, this, is, this is the most fun I've had in a while with, um, well, certainly the most fun I've had in a while with Pete Enns. So there you go. The sin of certainty coming your way. Well, welcome to Face to Face. We are joined by a returning guest and a, and a very special guest, uh, uh, author, uh, speaker, and a, a guy who owns a whole lot of animals um, from, from what his bio <laughs> says online. Pete Enns is here with us today. Thanks a lot for your time today, Pete. I sure, David. It. Glad to be here. You, um, so how come so many animals? So you got three dogs, I don't know. two cats, I don't know. and a well, rabbit. We have, uh, right now, three dogs, two cats, and a rabbit. Our family record was three dogs, three cats, two ferrets, and 11 rabbits. And the reason <laughs> we had 11 rabbits is because the 18-year-old at the pet store said, sure, they're both males. Ah, yes. So you were and lied they to. they weren't. So we came home and we had to, like, you know, find homes for them. But anyway, so. <laughs> I don't know. It just, it just sort of happens. You know, I don't know. Maybe we're sort of Catholic or something. I don't yeah. Know. And do they have a good adoption program in your, in your area for, for rabbits? <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, well, that worked well, out well, but you know, we still have the dogs and the cats, and, and probably no longer as well funded as it used to be under the new the new government. Exactly right. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we're going to talk about a whole lot of things today, I think, and hopefully have a little bit of fun along the way. But you've got a new book that came out just last year, published by Harper One, uh, called "The Sin of Certainty: Why God Desires Our Trust More Than Our Correct Beliefs," and you've put "correct" in uh, quotes. Yeah. Exactly. And I have well, I have so many questions. I mean, as <laughs> what little I think we we've we've developed a little bit of a, a friendly relationship on 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 the phone and through email and so on. And I love chatting to you about pretty much anything. But uh, I think you know enough to, about me to know that I studied philosophy. So I mean, I'm I'm all in. I mean, Pete. Okay, Pete. Here here we go. I'm certain that my wife likes likes me. How could yeah. how could that ever be a sin? It's not. Oh, okay. <laughs> we're not talking about that i'm i'm, I'm certain are we right at the end are we I'm, at the no. end of the podcast now <laughs> yeah exactly we're done thank you thanks for david coming the, to my final yeah. answer is maybe yeah i'm sitting right now on my sofa and i'm certain and one of my two cats is on my lap i'm absolutely certain of that there's no question but this that's not the same thing as you know certainty about eternal absolute things like God and our relationship with God and what it means to believe in God and things like that. And even there, people do feel at times this, they have a, like a certitude about, mm. or, or let's say a confidence in their faith. There's nothing wrong with that. The sin of certainty is when you lose that, let's say that certitude, you lose that sense of like really knowing what you believe, which happens to everybody. And then you think to yourself, my object is to get back that certainty that I had. It's a preoccupation with the needing to be certain in order for the life of faith to go forward. And my point in the book is that the sin of certainty is thinking that you cannot move without being certain. Mm. Rather, what we have to do is walk by faith. And that's sort of a trite thing to say, but it's true. And we have to sometimes move forward without being sure. 
without being certain, because maybe God wants to actually show us something. Maybe God wants to teach us something, like not relying on our little pictures of God. So in a sense, I mean, you look at the the subtitle, uh, Why God Desires Her Trust More Than Our Correct Beliefs. I mean, probably... uh, for you know, to take the term non-faith based, I, I would imagine non-faith based folk are not going to pick this book up, but they might. Um, but, uh, it depends but, on where they were from. Yeah, it's right, or what their background yeah. was, I suppose. Right, right, yeah. Right. yeah. Um, but is there a sense for you uh, w- that we're all walking by faith, faith based <laughs> and non-faith based people? From where you're standing, are we? Well, all? I would say that's true. I okay. think none of us can be certain. Of you know God or not God, right? I don't think any of us can be certain of that. And and those I have friends of mine who are certain that God doesn't exist, but that's because they have, let's call it a rationalistic evidentialist epistemology. Right. Can we say that on your? On your, on your, on your I program? I think we can. We might okay. want to unpack it a tiny bit. <laughs> you know, and I'm I'm all for reason. You know, I use yep. it all the time. I write books. I think. I teach. I do all that. But, you know, I guess I, mean, I, I can't defend this rationally. That would be sort of, uh, you know, paradoxical. But um, I just, you know, I'm 56. Um, the older I get, the more I think I cannot apprehend God and get my arms around God intellectually. I, I, I cannot control the creator of a cosmos I don't even understand. What I can do is experience God. And sometimes those experiences should take precedent over what we think of as our reasoning ability. Mm because our reasoning ability is limited, because we're just people. Right? And I think that's something that's missing, especially in you know, the conservative, let's say evangelical iteration of the Christian faith, when it comes to like defending a system. We don't really think enough about the power of our experience. Mm. We say, well, that's mm. subjective. Well, our reasoning is subjective, too. Everything is subjective. Um, but our experience of God is something that I, I'm, I'm looking to more and more as that um, sense of, I'm trying to not use the word certainty because it's misunderstood, but, you know, that that sense of, like, um, comfort and and, and surety that does not rest on whether I understand. And it allows me to sort of walk by faith with an experience of God, but also sometimes doubting very seriously some important things because they don't make sense to me. But that's okay. So, 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 yeah, so doubt is, is entirely okay within this, this, uh, would you say this worldview that you've stepped into or you've, um, you've had to reconstruct in a way? Uh, is there a, is there an ugly past here that you're sort of... <laughs> There's always an ugly past. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'd say that it's something that I've grown into slowly mm. through, I guess, discovery and through maybe necessity. Right. Uh, because life just gets complicated sometimes. And, um, you know, the hook for me was my inability to control my family with my mind, right? <laughs> if, you want, if you want a sense of absolute it's certainty good. in your life, don't have a family. Because so are you, are you, you, you don't sound like a control freak, but that's kind of what I'm oh, hearing. Oh, gosh, you don't know me. <laughs> <laughs> I do know that you like to eat Oreos, and sometimes, I do. yeah. But right. I'm, st- I'm stopping that. Okay, good. Anyway. But yeah, that, you no, can, I, that you can control, just so you know, Pete. I, I can, and yeah. I need to. Yeah. I need to control some things, <laughs> but not other people and not God. So, you know, um, it, it's realizing how... How, I guess, uh, you know, through, through much of my life, not my entire life, but let's say you know, 20s and 30s and 40s, thinking uh, implicitly, without even really articulating it to myself, that my mind is sufficient for making things happen, to keeping things safe and keeping things the way they are. And when life gets complicated, when there's pain you can't control, when things that happen that are totally out of your control and you have nothing to hold on to, you, you, your sense of control becomes a fantasy. Then you have to decide, what are you going to do? And that's a process that I went through over months and, and maybe even really two or three years of saying, well, really, I think this is what the Bible has been talking about, <laughs> trusting God mm. and not controlling and not thinking that you've got it all down and not thinking that you have right ideas about God. Even, even in the Bible, people think one thing about God and they realize this doesn't work. If you, you can't, if Pete, Pete, if you can't have certainty, though, why, why bother? Uh, yeah, I think, see, even that question privileges c- c- certainty as a central issue. That's good. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, I, I, 
Yeah, go. Yeah, please. Are you with me? Yeah, no, totally. I'm with you. Yeah, okay, yeah no, for yeah, sure. Yeah, no, um, it presupposes that we can know everything. Right. And, in and in a two plus think, two, in oh, a two plus two equals four kind of a way. Right, and, and I do believe that two plus two equals four, even though my math friends tell me it doesn't, and I right. just ignore them and throw things at them. Well, ask the Babylonians or, or the Mesopotamians; they had a different system. So, different system. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you know. Um, it, it's um, you know certainty is something that it does come and go, mm. and we can't rely on it. And you know, I hate using words like this because people are just going to say, "Oh, you're such a snob." But <laughs> you know, if you pay attention, if you try to be aware and present with God's presence, there's a sort of an enlightenment that happens where you just and it, and it's a humbling enlightenment where you realize, listen, I don't know everything, I won't know everything. It's okay. You know, you're on this path of learning to trust God. So hang even on a sec. It's difficult, even if you don't want to. Even if you don't want to. So right. let's just back up a little. So uh, um, did, did I hear meditation there, or did I hear uh, the sense of just, I don't know, mystery and wonder and saying, here I am sitting at my desk, I'm surrounded by books and movie posters and, and things, mm-hmm. and you want me to sit back and just kind of become aware of the presence of God? Yeah, sort is of. That, is that kind of what you're saying, or...? Yeah, and, and I mean, uh, not manufacture it, but I think right. being open to right. okay. the presence of God, which I think on a fundamental level, you know, see, if you don't think of God as up there and out there someplace making cameo appearances, <laughs> right? right? <laughs> Sitting but on the, God big, as, the big throne. As the ever present spirit and, 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 you know, creator and sustainer of life. This isn't pantheism, it isn't panentheism, but it's just God is bigger and pervasive, mm-hmm. and the Spirit of God is everywhere, right? So if that's true, it's a matter of becoming aware of that rather than calling upon a distant deity on the throne above the clouds someplace. Do you think this opens up the, 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 the room for, for more conversation with people who... The, you know those you know those rational lists as you talked about earlier, uh, briefly talked about earlier. Who 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 can't see a god or who are so empirically driven that it's it's it just the facts, ma'am, and we're not interested in anything else. Sort of the Bill Mars of the world, if you will. Right. I mean, I I hope it would. Um, although, uh, you know, I think it would be hard epistemologically, right, to convince someone whose entire life is built around if there's no evidence, I don't believe it. Right, so you got to convince somebody like that. But I think at least putting that in front of them that listen, you know, maybe the problem here it's not that reason is bad; is that maybe our sense of 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 knowing things through reason and through evidence that maybe has to be decentered. Right, and is a part of our human experience, a very, very important and vital part of our human experience. But maybe not everything. Maybe God is in the job of giving surprises all the time that send our brains going wacky and haywire, which, again, is things that I see in the biblical story itself. It's full of, like, yeah, this makes no sense. Maybe that's just the way it is. there, there, There must be... Well, let's talk about the reaction to some of this, and maybe, uh, you mm-hmm. know, I was going to go to fear, and, well, hang on a minute here. If you're starting to talk this way, then, well, what about that, and what about this sure. story, and what about my understanding of, you know, all of a sudden everything's in question. Um, mm-hmm. You use the you use the word trans-rational in the mm-hmm. book. Um, I love the book, by the way, if I haven't said that already, and and I hope everybody reads so this book. I. Yeah. I mean, you clearly have issues with the Bible. I mean, what's the, your other book, The Bible Tells Me So? I mean, it's... <laughs> It's it's it runs pretty deep, Pete. It it's, does, yeah, it? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I understand too. Let's get a little plug in. You're writing something new, or you're in the middle of uh, making notes. Well, yeah, I'm starting. I'm I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm getting to a point where I'm articulating what I think I'm going to be writing about, mm. and it's sort of things I wish I had known about the Christian faith 30 years ago. Right. Didn't. Right. Right. And it's sort of like that, and it's you know talking a lot about different things that I've found to be true and more sustaining and and had I known them 30 years ago what difference it would have made and all that kind of stuff so yeah good well we'll look forward to that I guess no name yet no name no structure no publisher nothing nothing written on my no Harper one oh good I'm I'm gonna do a Harper one and um, any idea how long it's gonna spend on the New York Times bestseller list I don't know, but oh, okay. I hope they make a movie out of it. <laughs> Starring Roseanne Barr. That's right. Figure it out. So tell me um, about Transrational. 
Well, what I mean by that, and here's the funny thing with transrational. I I felt so stupid. I um, I read uh, Richard Rohr's book within the past six months, Things Hidden. Okay. Which is a, his book about scripture, and he publishes in 2008, and he uses the word too. And I said, I feel like I ripped him off without even knowing it, and I sort of have apologized to him. Since then. But <laughs> anyway, so it, it's good that I'm sort of cracking with somebody who's thought very deeply about these things. But um, th- what I mean by that is, is the the Christian faith is rooted in a couple of things that really defy rational explanation, namely incarnation, whatever we mean by that, and resurrection. Things that just don't make sense, they're paradoxical. They're not like, oh yeah, here's the evidence, and therefore right. I believe this sort of right. thing, right? So, but I don't want to say, so the, so the Christian faith is not fundamentally a rational faith, but it's not irrational either, it's not anti-rational, because we do think and we do process, and that's part of what makes us human. But rather the ultimate, um, the foundations of the Christian faith are beyond our ability to reason. There's something there that we simply do have to am- apprehend by faith. And that's all I mean by that, you know, and I think it's a very helpful term because um, it's not a matter of, like, is this reasonable or unreasonable? It's beyond reason. Well, and, and that's it, a matter of faith of accepting and it. And isn't there a sense in which, and I know the analogy breaks down, believe me, but isn't there a sense in which, I'm going to come back to my original question, I know that Elizabeth loves me, but I not, I mean, I'm certain of it, but I couldn't lay it out for you. Right. In a in a in a rationalistic way, I could right. you know I could I could write an essay about it and a poem, and mm-hmm. you could go, oh, isn't it wonderful? Look right. at the two of them behaving together. Right. But we wouldn't have that same kind of certainty that it seems a lot of us are looking for elsewhere. That's correct. But I think the process is very similar because you might not be able to lay out your uh, your love. For, I'm assuming she's your wife. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. right. I, you never know. My I ferret, just, actually. Yeah. Here or anything. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Elizabeth, right? Your yes, wife, Elizabeth. You, yeah. you can't lay that out, let's say, in an in a analytical, rational way. What you're really talking about here is that you have such a fundamental experience of her. And then the analytical, the rational stuff, it comes in afterwards. Right. Right. So fundamentally, this is not, it's not analysis first and then, you know, the experience. It's experience first and then we analyze the difference, I think, with faith in God is that we have an experience that ultimately defies any sort of analytical right. explanation. Right. But we still do that because we can, we can structure our faith in ways that make sense, that, that moves us and drives us further. Right? But when we get to those points where things don't make sense, in other words, when we're not certain about something, our faith doesn't crumble and fall apart. We just acknowledge that as part of the journey of faith. See, that, that's the big issue. It's like when you start doubting or you're not sure anymore, therefore you have no faith. Right. Or you have weak faith. Right. I, I think that's nonsense. You know, it's part of the journey of faith that we inevitably experience at some point in time in our lives. Um, I got, you know, there, there's r- rare there's an interview that goes by that I don't quote you to. Um, don't, don't believe the devil, don't believe his book, but the truth is not the same without the lies he made up. Mm. So isn't there a sense, and I rarely quote you two, by the way, but <laughs> there's a sense that's from God Part 2 on Rattle and Hum. Can you yeah. tell I'm a fan? Uh, <laughs> there's, there's a part of me that says, you, you're, I don't know that I'm going to believe you're that much of a believer if you don't doubt. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to question your faith if you don't doubt. Right. Like, how, how strong could it actually be? Because you haven't really tested it. And, and you I think. haven't, and see, this is, we can bring into this the notion of, of, of the biblical notion of wisdom. Mm. And wisdom is rooted in experience. And people who don't, people who say, I've never really struggled about any of this stuff. Right. I don't care if you're 15 or if you're 150 years old, you lack life experience. And therefore, your testimony is less valid to me. Interesting. So you should be spending a lot of time in um, penitentiaries. Or therapy. <laughs> or therapy, or a bit of both. Or <laughs> right, yeah. I mean, to experience the, the messy part of life, yeah. which is part of the mystery of the Christian faith, that God participates in the deepest messiness. Well, and, and that's where you see things differently. That's when you get, let's say, you, get, you might get a clarity there, which is not the same thing as an intellectual certainty. Did I just hear a little bit of an argument for watching great film, uh, reading great novels, uh, reading more poetry, spending more time at art galleries? Yeah, probably. Okay. Although I don't spend enough time in art galleries and I don't like poetry. 
But that's my problem. <laughs> that's maybe, your maybe problem. Maybe I like life experience. That's I do watch tons of good shows on Netflix. I guess what I'm getting to is, is well, uh, how about we spend a lot more time listening to other people's stories? And I think a right. great way to do that is through novels and fiction and, and, right. and poetry right. and great film. Or and, hanging out at the coffee shop. Exactly right. And, and, and you know, what did Jesus do? Tell mm. stories. Right, <laughs> right, to right. Told stories, right. Right. Exactly. And yeah. And that's, that's a way of capturing... I mean, this is a blanket statement, but I'll say it anyway. Why not? I think stories are a better way of trying to, um, let's say, access ultimate reality mm. than processing through only like one half of our brain. What What is a knowledge-based faith? And I think you've touched on it, but you do actually, you, you, you do unpack this in the book, but I'd love to hear, you know, that, that immediate answer. It, what is a knowledge? Yeah, what is a knowledge based faith? So well, if I'm sitting all around faith here. Has knowledge involved. You know, it isn't like we're not like, it's not contentless, right? Right. But a knowledge based faith is, you know, in, in a negative sense, is a faith that cannot proceed without a sense of, you know, feeling certain about facts, right? And um, that is a problem, right? Because that's exactly the thing that winds up crumbling eventually. Because. You know, you get involved, you, you, you have life experiences, you, you read books, right? You watch movies, you meet new people with their stories, and all of a sudden your way of packaging the universe doesn't make as much sense. Well, it's, right? not, it's not really faith, is it, Pete? Well, I don't, I don't think that it is. You know, and right. I think, again, the biblical witness, which is surprisingly diverse and subtle on these things, it really does come down to trusting God even when God is absent. Hmm. Not when God hmm. feels absent, when hmm. God is absent. Hmm. Right? Sometimes people say, you know, if, if um, uh, where did I last year, this, uh, you know, maybe a church mark here or something, you know, when, um, when God feels absent, he didn't move, you did. Right. I, d- I don't agree with that. <laughs> I mean, from, from, in terms of the biblical hmm. witness, I think sometimes the, the, you know, the psalmist is pleading, basically, I haven't done anything. Right. Or Job, I haven't done a uh, Thing. I'm just living here, and all of a sudden this crap happens to me. Where are you? I think it's a very legitimate question to ask. I think Jesus asked it on the cross. You know, why have you forsaken me? Not why do I feel a sense of your abandonment, but I'm the one who moved. See, why there's a th- me? see. I, I I think there's an honesty and an authenticity and a and a and a, and a willingness to hmm, be open to other others and other stories and openness to be willing to be wrong. I guess right. is what I'm saying there that. I would suggest that we haven't really heard a lot from any church, frankly, and probably most religions. Right. Is that is that a fair statement? I think. Well, it makes sense to me. I think being open to, open to others and being vulnerable. Um, no, we're not going to be. We're not going to win any medals for apologetics. <laughs> right. But I think, and I really want this to be understood in the way that I mean it. I think we'll be more in touch with our humanity. Mm. And I think that's basically restoring our full humanity is the point of the gospel, right? In in Christ, renewing our humanity and making us fully human, you know, restoring what was lost in the ancient story of Adam and on, and Jesus is the new Adam, and we have a new uh, vigorous humanity that's renewed in the crucified and risen Christ. See, I mean, I this, that's the point. this is the stuff that sort of starts to really resonate with me on a, on a variety of levels, because, I mean, I grew up in a, in a tradition that, that the way I remember it, the way I was taught, certainly did not talk about the humanity of God in right. any way, shape, or form. I mean, God was out there, uh, mm-hmm. a very Cartesian God, really, right? Yes. God is somewhere, so we've got to get to God, or very Platonic God, I guess, in a sense. Yeah. You know, Plato had it right, we didn't. <laughs> right. Um, and I think... And I got, and I had to, and I had to get there, right? Right. I had to get to that God. And that's, right. you know, and so therefore, what do I do? Uh, I strive, I do, I, I've got to-do lists now today that are miles long, and, you right. know, I, you know, and have sought therapy for that. Or, or you, know? you know, the way that you, let's say, access this distant Platonic God is through the gift that he's given us, mm. which mm. is the Bible. Mm. Now, that's why it becomes absolutely imperative that there are no ambiguities or contradictions or tensions in the Bible. Right. This is God's way of communing with you. It's through a book, which means you have to be able to read. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> you know, yeah. all that kind of stuff, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. 
So yeah, no, there's um, some certainly certainly some built-in problems there. And you know what's interesting? I look back, and I now I'm going to sound uh, 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 maybe a little crazy here, but I think on a certain level, I was never quite right with it. You yeah. know, back to my mid teen. I mean, I, the truth is, I started reading philosophy at a pretty young age, and and I can probably blame C.S. Lewis and the Narnia yeah. Tales for it. But but there was something about that approach that just didn't sit well with me. Right, right. Um, it seems like is that that's it? That's what we got. <laughs> right, right, right. Really? Yeah, yeah. This is all you can do. Yeah, yeah. Kind of like that's you. That's a teeny tiny god, and I think then the atheist critique makes tremendous. Oh, sense. it makes absolute sense. Open, sense. open the door and come on in. Right. You you right. guys need to take the pulpit for heaven's sakes and and yeah. teach us a thing or two. Or, or Carl Sagan's pale blue dot. You know the, his 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 soliloquy at the end of the original Cosmos series, which is actually reproduced in the recent one by uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Mm. And it's it's a beautiful soliloquy about essentially the insignificance of the earth, right. the insignificance of humanity. We shouldn't be fighting against each other. And I could see that you change a few words here and there, that could be preached as a sermon. Right. Right. Don't stop killing each other. You're not that important and God is big and stop killing each other over ideas. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, can I read a quote from the um, book? Um from who? From you. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I love love myself. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) that's right. Quote, I have a love-hate relationship with this story because it is both liberating and also tells me to do something I don't want to do and that I'm not very good at when I try. A simply delightful nature-nurture trait I picked up from my immigrant parents is a disposition toward anxiety, a preoccupation with all sorts of possible futures. Fretting about the things Jesus says not to fret about is what I do best. Close quote. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just <laughs> love your sense of humor. Love the way you write. It's just it's really quite wonderful. And I think there's there's so much humanity there. Um, yeah. Is is that anx- I mean, we just talked a little bit about you know a setup for that kind of anxiety potentially. You know, certainly right. philosophically and philo- theologically. What about relationally? What does this do, and how we relate to others? And I'm I'm not making that connection for you necessarily. I'd love right. for you to tell me about that. But but um, yeah. Well, I, th- I think it it um, encourages uh, an insider outsider mentality, mm-hmm. and hmm. you know the other is the enemy. Right, right. Because you're afraid of what that influence might do to your nicely scripted view of the nature of God and humanity and our relationship to God and things like that. So, I mean, this is really, I mean, to be open is very threat, and it is threatening. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not minimizing that. It is. Mm-hmm. I would like to have my little tribe, and I know we're right, and everybody else is wrong. Part of me would like to have that because I would, I would, I would glide through life, and no matter what happens, I'd have a good answer for it. And right. That's all there is to it. But I mean, life isn't like that. And wanting to get back into that tribal mentality. This is a way of summarizing the book. Get back into that tribal mentality to feel safe. That's the sin of certainty. You can't stay there. You have to keep going. And guess what? You don't get to know the outcome. You have to trust God along the way. So your correct beliefs, quote unquote, correct beliefs, uh, those are those are things to help you along the way. But that's not it. Mm. That's not the end process. The end process is something else. And so I think it's a deeper communion. And I would even use the word mystical communion with God, that is transrational and is transtribal and humbles us as people and doesn't make us think that we're masters of the universe. So some so somebody reads your book, um, says, I, I kind of get this, I kind of believe this, but it challenges everything I've learned, everything I've been taught. Mm-hmm. Like, how do, how do I start over? How do I begin again? I mean, yeah. you know, you're talking about faith as trust, and, and I want to, to, to hear more about that. But, I mean, does this have to happen uh, in a community? Does this have to happen in a family? Does this have to happen with, you know, others who not necessarily believe the same way, but, but right. are willing to, I don't know, kind of walk the journey with well, you? Well, I, I think it does. I mean, sometimes the family part is hard because, I mean, and not in my family, but I know people like, uh, you know, a husband or wife is beginning to process things and moving out of, you know, the sin of certainty mentality, but, you know, they can't talk to their spouse because mm-hmm. it's too threatening, and, mm-hmm. and you can't choose that. That's a different thing than, let's say, finding a community of believers, whether they're, you know, virtual or or, or actual, right? You know, um, right. Uh, and you know, for me, for example, it meant a process of moving towards a church tradition that is more liturgically based than sermon based. 
And for me, that was a healthy transition. It wasn't fraught with anger or anything like that. It, it took it took me a little while, but my wife and I decided to leave a church that we had been going to for several years and make great friends. But I knew that I couldn't stay there. I had to find another community to um, where where uh, where what I was becoming <clears throat> was not a problem, hmm. right? And, and and I think it, it's it's hard to do this alone. And you know, and sometimes it's hard to leave a church because you know you have young children. <clears throat> and and they're thriving and they have friends and that's important and sometimes I've told people maybe you should stay there, and you should try to find you know on your own on the side so to speak a community of people to help keep you sane. Um, so it's not always leaving a church that that works for people, but I do think finding a community in some sense is helpful for some people. That community is just reading books. Mm. You know that that's a way of connecting with other people and and engaging with with maybe even online. You know, websites and comment sections, people do that or they email me, you know, and, and I try to answer them if I can. But there are people who are who are really starving for some type of community as they move through, you know, this process. And it's 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 for some it's it's a stark it's a surprise to hear that what they've always thought about how things should be is actually not necessarily even a majority opinion in the Christian church. Mm. There are all sorts of Christians out there who understand <laughs> you know that you know, you're not you, doubt is a part of faith. Right. It's really not. It's not the enemy that you think that it is. Mm, nice. You you. I mean, I know a bit of your journey, Pete, and you're, you've been very open about it in other books, and I think on our other podcast and online and so on, and people can find out about it. Um, you've got a chapter in the book uh, uh, when Christians eat their own. Yeah. And and you there's a, a small quote again. I'm going to quote quote the dark underbelly of Christian organizations can look more like the dirty political scheming of Francis and Claire Underwood than the Sermon on the Mount. Close mm-hmm. quote. Now most you know listeners who haven't watched the House of Cards won't get that reference, but run run to your nearest Netflix. Run to uh, your Netflix. <laughs> yeah. And, and what is it? Fourth <laughs> season now. It's a pretty dark take on on what's going on in U.S. politics, but some pretty interesting stuff going on there. Um, yeah. Obviously, tongue was sort of planted firmly in cheek, I would imagine, there. <laughs> however, and you're quite yeah. gifted in hyperbole, however, um, you've got reason to, 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 you know, to write a sentence like that, to make that kind of a comparison. Yeah, I'm, and, and I think many people have, too. But, mm. you know, our experiences some places, sometimes in, in institutional Christianity, whether it's a church or a school or, or, or you know, an organization of some sort, um, sometimes how people treat each other is really, really uh, debilitating to faith. You right. Know? And, and I, I mean, a part of this chapter was I did a survey on my blog a few years ago about, you know, I asked people, what are, give me a, a reason or two, um, a, a couple of things that make it difficult for you to stay Christian. Right. And I, I collated them into five responses, and, you know, like science, the Bible, stuff like that. But the one that really sort of surprised me was um, how Christians have, been, have, have treated them. People in authority um, have ostracized them, shamed them, you know, um, ignored them, made them feel horrible because they were honest enough to say, "I'm just not, I'm not sure what I believe right, right, now. right." And 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 you know, that's the the the, the irony is that um, uh, you know th- that's like one of the worst things that can happen to people. And and I've come to. You know, think of that and, and, and explain it maybe at least for myself uh, by saying that, you know, it's in the community where we see God most clearly. It is in other people. Mm. And, you know, no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, that's that the presence of God is found there in First John 4 or whatever. And, and uh, I really saw that, that I mean, I know people who have turned away from the faith after being mistreated for a prolonged period of time. And you might say, well, can't you just get over that Christ. and think more, quote, rationally about your right. faith? Right, You can, but the thing is that who we are is wrapped up in our relationships with others. We're social and psychological beings. And, uh, you know, that's why that kind of harm is, is sometimes very, very difficult to repair, if at all. You know, and it's, 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 um, it's a shame because of all the obstacles people, all the challenges that people feel to the Christian faith, like in that blog that I mentioned, that survey, this is the one that Christians can actually do something about. I mean, I can't, I can't change the fact that Genesis 1 and science make no sense together. Right. I can't change that. I can change how I act towards other people. And that's like the most debilitating thing. If you're going through a difficult time for whatever reason of, of doubting and struggling with your faith, having a community of people that just let you be 
is worth, you know, a lot of, you know, all the, all the gold on earth, you know, as far as I'm concerned. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's, you know, that is, gives you a, um, a sense of, of belonging and, and, and a sense of support that you're moving through a journey of faith at that point in time. Even like being anointed for a journey by a community of faith saying, we don't know what you're going through, but we're here with you. And, and you're still a part of us no matter what. Yeah, we're, we we'll, we'll, we'll mourn with you, whatever that means. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah whether, whether you're mourning a loss of faith, you're mourning a loss of reason, <laughs> mm-hmm. or, yeah. or, or your, 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 uh, your epistemology is in question. <laughs> right. <laughs> right? Because, yeah. I mean, you know, as crazy as that sounds, you know, it would make a great bumper sticker. I bet it would fly off the shelves. Right. Um, right. But it's true, right? I mean, mm-hmm. I th- that isn't, isn't that kind of what... Wow, isn't that kind of what most of us are kind of struggling with to some degree? What you know, Nietzsche talking about testing the idols. Are are yeah. we all kind of doing that right now? Isn't the U.S. doing that right now in politics? Right, right. absolutely, yeah. And having you know again that sense of support. <laughs> yeah, ch- church should be the place where you can do that sort of thing. Exactly, it should be exactly right. Yeah, yeah. So what's no. wrong with this picture? Um, so we got to wrap it up soon, and I hate that. Um, yeah. But uh, can I ask a couple more questions before? Yeah, we, sure. We, yeah. So, so you quote. I mean, you quote my favorite philosopher in the book, and, and, and Pascal said that the quote, "The eternal silence of the infinite spaces terrify me." <laughs> Close quote. It's so beautiful. I love your your laughter. Um, and I mean, I, I the Ponze is probably one of my most well uh, worn out books and mm. marked out books. Or my copy of it anyway i'm sure there's a few different translations out there but um i mean what a shame about pascal right on on so many levels such a young age and didn't have time to unpack some of this stuff is that is that your doubt bubbling to the surface is that is that eternal silence is that is that the is that the blue the you know the pale blue dot coming um no i I wouldn't say i mean i have to think about that i don't think so um, I, the reason why I cited Pascal there was because, uh, you know, uh, Psalm, oh gosh, 18, I think it's 18, um, you know, the heavens declare the glory of God. And, you know, the psalmist looking up and saying, wow, the, the world is beautiful, this declares God's glory. And the more we know about outer space and dark matter and how big things are, how, how literally unfathomable I know. the universe. I know. You know, it's, it's like you look at that and you say, this is actually scaring the daylights out. <laughs> when I figured out how far we were away, like actually figured out how long it would take to get to the next galaxy, I was mm-hmm. just, it's, it's, yeah. I, yeah, we're done. I know, no, I know nothing about it, right? <laughs> Zero. But when I just saw that, rec- it was fairly recently with my son, we looked it up and, and we tried to figure out how long it would take us to get there. Yeah. Uh, ast- Some, I mean, numbers that just don't mean anything. Oh, it's astounding. Right. You know, like, even a light year means nothing. I mean, right. traveling at the speed of light, which you can't even conceive. Yes. You know, I just it's just that that alone is just unfathomable. And you know, if if God exists, right, what kind of a God are we dealing with? And I don't think I have anything <laughs> to add to this discussion. Yeah, it's other it's, than other than from my own experience. Yes, it's it's such a great question. If God exists, and this is what we've got. What kind of a God are we dealing with? It's, right, it's, right. it's remarkable, which then leaves us open to a whole lot of conversation and interpretation and, and, and I uh, guess, you know, as Kierkegaard would say, subjectivity. So doesn't that scare the heck out of a whole lot of people, which takes me to, I guess, maybe my, my coming up on my last question, I suppose, mm-hmm. sadly. Um, what's the reaction been like to the sin of certainty? Um, well, it depends. I mean, right. um, I don't hear everything. I mean, I've, I've heard <laughs> I've heard some, you know, criticism, which is expected. Yeah, you know, of course. I, I, yeah. I understand that people who come from a different model, a different way of thinking about the nature of their faith, will either not like this at all and 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 rail against it, or ask questions like, "Well, if this is true, like you said before, this is true. Then how about this, 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 this?" And sure. This? And they're asking honest questions, but they're still coming at it from that mentality of intellectual certitude is actually foundational for my faith. Without that, I don't really have a reason to believe, right? So I have that. But on the other hand, I have to tell you, David, it's, you know, the a lot of people said just, you know, thanks for saying mm-hmm. what I'm thinking. And, right. You know, I right. don't have a website to do that. So, right, you know, right, and, right. And sometimes quietly, you know, people, I, see, I've given this talk in, in academic settings with a room full of biblical scholars 
being very vulnerable about doubt in myself and how I deal with it with my students who also have periods of doubt and skepticism. And I wasn't sure it was going to come across because it's not an academic discussion, right. but um, the the support through the questions about people saying, yeah, this is this describes me and the people that I deal with, you know, and, and so I'm I'm very you know I'm very happy to have to, to connect with people in that sense, you know. I'm, yeah. I'm happy that people, not that they like me, I'm happy that people. I'm I'm not just saying things that are for five people out there. Well, I think, I think, I mean, listen, I love the book and I think there's so many entry points for so many different people. Uh, but I, I think one of the greatest strengths is, 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 is the book's humanity. You, you come out of the pages. You're, there's an honesty and a, and an authenticity. And I, th- and I, and I mentioned that earlier, but it's, 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 it's not, it's, it, how's this? It's trans academic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well there you go. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think I think it's just it's 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 appealing on so many levels and mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. but but here we go. So and and here we go and and move into sort of the 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 last question. It doesn't still bring me I think after all the after 51 years, you know, lots of reading, lots of relationships, um lots of um you know, Australian red wine. <laughs> I still don't have the clarity that I think I'd really like, Pete. Yeah. It still kind of pisses me off. Yeah, well, I'm still. I think I'm still. Yeah. I think I'm still a little bit angry about that. Yeah. Well, you know what? Here's the story that I tell every chance I get, and it's in the book, and it's with Mother Teresa, and when John Cavanaugh, the, I think he was a moral philosopher at um, St. Louis University. He just died, mm. like I think two years ago something but anyway he was having his own crisis of faith and crisis mm-hmm. of clarity in the mid-1970s he went to visit mother Teresa in calcutta and um it, she said what can i do for you he said you can pray for me and she said what would you like me to pray for and he said pray that i have clarity mm. he was going through his own crisis of meaning and purpose as, as we all do and she responded no i will not pray for that and he looked at it and I said, why not? And she said, because clarity is the last thing you are clinging to and must let go of. Mm. Now, when that's I read good. that years ago, I said, oh, my goodness gracious. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's sort of describing me. But then the conversation continues. He said, listen, that's not fair. You seem to have a lot of clarity. At that point, she just laughed. <laughs> she said, clarity, I haven't had clarity in my life. Right. What I've had is trust. So I will pray that you trust God. The title of the book is very much inspired directly by my experience reading that exchange online. Wow. You know, I, t- I tell my students uh, what helped me was I met this woman on the Internet. And <laughs> they don't think that's funny. But, um, so, you know, j- listening to this exchange, which is, you know, yeah. it's, it's a pretty well-known one. It's been reproduced. You know, um, Brandon Manning reproduced it, and, and a lot others have. Yeah. But it, it's, it's, you know, that to me, it, it hits something like it's not about gaining clarity. It's about trusting God whether you're clear or not. And, you know, Mother Teresa had, you know, the famous 40-something year period of the absence of God until towards the end of her life. Right? So maybe, and I remember thinking to myself, I've been doing it wrong. Right, right, <laughs> I've right. I've had everything backwards. Right. And, and maybe, maybe there is a, a, a power here that I'm underestimating. Mm. And I, I don't think it's an accident that the thing that Mother Teresa did to help others is unrelated to her sense of God's absence. Hmm. I, I think it drove, those were acts of trust on her part. That's how I interpret them. So, so maybe her, her tr- attempt at, you know, being aware of God's presence was through uh, uh, helping others. Right. And, and, and her, her, um, her determination to, quote, trust slash serve God regardless of where her mind was. Right. Right. I mean, you can't kill somebody like that. You know what I mean? Mm. <laughs> in terms of faith, I mean, when you get to that point, there's nothing anybody can do to you. You know, there's no doubt that can enter your head that is going to be sufficient to undo that life of faith. Well, wow. I wish we could keep going, and, and I hope we do and, and have another opportunity. One of these days, we're going to do one of these interviews face-to-face. I, uh, yeah, this, this, great. I mean, what a great conversation here today about faith as trust and, and not 
you know, as certainty. For me, one of the takeaways, trusting God even when he's absent. Uh, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll reflect on that a little further. Pete Enns is here with us today. Uh, we've been talking about the sin of certainty. Harper One, check it out. It's, it's online. I'm sure it's on an audio book for sure. But, you know, go, go old school. Get the real book, will you? <laughs> um, subtitled, Why God Desires Our Trust More Than Our Correct Beliefs. Uh, Pete, thanks a lot for your time today. I really appreciate it. You bet, David. Have a good one. Thanks for having me.